Hello and welcome to Time for God from St Peter's Bexhill, where we're thinking about a very famous passage from Isaiah 55. And we don't start with a joke this week, but a very serious quote from Abraham Lincoln, always a good source of quotations. He said, Die when I may. I want it said of me that I plucked a weed and planted a flower where I thought a flower would grow. Now we know that Abraham Lincoln did a lot more than plant a few flowers. He really sorted out a lot of problems. But it is a nice way of summing up what a life worth living is all about. However, if you do pluck a weed in the churchyard, please check with the churchyard team first to make sure it is a weed and not a beautiful and very rare wild flower. For this morning, we are thinking about living a good life. And with that comes invitations and chances. God gives us an invitation to live a good life and we have the chance to do it. We start in that reading from Isaiah with the invitation, an invitation to a banquet. It is rather a strange invitation. For a start, there is no name on it. It is sent out to everyone. And there is no reference to social rank to know what to do, or to people of sufficient means to know what to wear, or even reference to background or belief to know what to think. The only requirement for coming is hunger and thirst. Come all you who are thirsty. So what sort of banquet is it? Well, for a start, it is a free banquet. I suppose you would expect that of a banquet to be free. But Isaiah tells us that there are still people who are trying to buy food and wine, even though they can see and smell the wonderful riches that are freely spread out on God's banqueting table. It is almost as if they are afraid to believe in the generosity of what is in front of them. And we all know people like this, people trying to find meaning in their lives by searching, working, buying, particularly buying, when the answer is right there, right in front of them, and it is completely free. All you have to be is thirsty, hungry, and we are all thirsty, hungry for meaning in our lives, all of us. So surely there must be a catch. Well, no, there are no hidden clauses. There is no small print. The invitation is for everyone, for the whole world. All who ask will receive. Banquets in the ancient world were then as now arranged to celebrate great events. And they were very big events, lasting for days at a time. And then, as now, usually only the top people were invited to the top banquets. Jesus uses the image of a banquet in some of his parables. In the parable of the wedding feast, for instance, the invited guests make excuses. They have other things to do rather than come. And so the invitation list is revised to include everyone else. Everyone while the original guests are turned away. And Jesus intends us to remember today's passage from Isaiah. The banquet, the banquet is meant to be seen as the most precious and wonderful thing. It is, quite simply, sitting and eating and living in God's presence. And it is free. All that can keep you away from this great gift is your own insisting that there is somewhere else you would rather be. And why would anyone do that? Well, perhaps you're not impressed that the invitation is open to everyone and not just you and the other top people. Rather a case of cutting off your nose to spite your face, if that is the case. And remember, as we've talked about before, this passage from Isaiah was written at a really bad time. The people of God were only a small remnant of slaves living in exile. They had been invaded and defeated. Yet even in this desperate situation, Isaiah tells the people that their God is great and his invitation will be eventually extended 
to include the whole world. The people may be small, but their God is big. Isaiah is stating very boldly that God's plan for the world is not defeated by events. Bad things happen in the world and they do not change God's love for the world. No, the everlasting promise of God's love is not going away. Rather, it will continually expand to include everyone who responds to the invitation. The people who first heard these words must have wondered. They had, after all, been defeated by a way of life that moved to a very different drumbeat. And we too can feel beaten down by an unfair world, by forces that seem greater than we can possibly bear, by forces that are man-made and natural. But God's love and peace is still here. It is always here. He speaks out clearly with real compassion. The blessing of the feast are there, waiting for us. Are you thirsty? The most basic need will be met if you come here. Turn to God and you will receive not only water, but milk and wine and the richest affair. All we have to do is seek the Lord while he may be found. After all, Isaiah reminds us, we cannot produce the rain or the snow. It falls without human effort and produces grain and food. And if we can't even produce rain for ourselves, we can't do anything. Everything good we have comes from God. And so it is on God's word alone that we can build our lives. And his word is love. God even loves the fig tree. In our second reading now, he loves it so much he gives it yet another chance to do what it is supposed to do, which is bear fruit. And like us, the fig tree has done nothing to deserve another chance. Let's hear the story. It's from Luke 13, verses 1 to 9, the parable of the fig tree. Now there were some present at that time who told Jesus about the Galileans whose blood Pilate had mixed with their sacrifices Jesus answered, do you think that these Galileans were worse sinners than all the other Galileans because they suffered this way? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Or those 18 who died when the tower in Siloam fell on them, do you think they were more guilty than all the others living in Jerusalem? I tell you, no. But unless you repent, you too will all perish. Then he told this parable, a man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard and he went to look for fruit on it but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig round it and fertilise it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. This is the word of the Lord. I think this story was something of a joke originally. There are some puns tucked away that get lost in translation and nothing dates like humour. It would have been quite funny. People would have laughed, even though there is a serious message underneath. Jesus is talking about Israel, which was often compared to a fig tree. But what he says equally applies to us. There is always one more chance until time runs out and there isn't. Those people who were murdered by Pilate, those people in the building that collapsed, didn't know that their chance was about to run out. Had they done anything bad to deserve their fate? No, of course not. They were no better or worse than anyone else. God loves them just as much. They were just there when it happened. The point Jesus is making is that time runs out in the end and none of us knows what the future holds. So we don't know when our time will run out either. The fig is a lovely tree, not very tall perhaps, growing to only about 20 feet, but it can be up to 30 feet wide and it gives good deep shade from the heat of the sun. Sitting under the fig tree was a popular thing to do. Remember that Jesus saw Nathanael under a fig tree at the start of John's Gospel. And the fruit was very popular too, and good for your digestion. 
The fig tree usually does well and produces fruit twice a year, in June off the old wood and in September off the new. It takes about three years for a new tree to reach maturity, and if it has not produced fruit by then, it's unlikely to produce any fruit at all. This is the situation in Jesus' little story. A tree that does not produce fruit is taking up room and feeding off the land and giving nothing back in return. Just providing shade for people to sit on is not enough. Remember, Jesus is not talking about trees. Just providing a bit of shade is not enough for our church either, or for you and me. All things have a purpose, and that includes us. Our role as church is to be rooted and grounded so that we produce fruit, the fruit of the Spirit. We are to spread the word in what we say and what we do and how we live. And the same goes for us as individuals. It's no use saying we are Christian if it does not show. So we must thank God that he gives us another chance to do that and another and another Maybe the second chance, but probably it's much further on than that for most of us. And thank God that we are still here for yet another year to try to get things right. Life with God is not plain sailing. We know that. There's no promise of a smooth path through life anywhere in the Bible. After all, just look at the life of the man we follow and how close he is now to the cross. But there is the promise of God with us and a great banquet at the end. This is what matters. For everyone who is thirsty and willing to come, there is everything we could possibly need or want. So we need to get on and spread this good news. We may feel we are very small, but our God is big and loves us completely, now and forever. Amen.